Hello and welcome to another episode of My Favourite Game from the Honest Football Podcast. On the show this week we've got the magnificent Emma Lippmann. Um, Emma is a, a truly inspirational character, uh, a professional footballer, someone who's a, a full international um, and actually has been, been brave enough uh, to, to go abroad to play football. And I, I think that she's a, an incredible um, example of, of just being brave enough to follow your dreams. And, and we also talk about the things that come with that, the sacrifices you need to make, but also the rewards of, of, of that so um, it's a magnificent episode it really is and we are, you know Emma is someone that you can um, definitely relate to in lots of ways not just as a footballer but in, in, in life in general so yeah enjoy it and don't forget if you'd like to be part of this favourite game series just give us a message at Honest Football 3 <laughs> And it's with great pleasure that I can uh, introduce Emma Lippman, who's on the show now. Uh, Emma, thanks so much for coming on. I apologise for the uh, the short notice uh, before and all of that. So I really appreciate you being here. So thank you very much. Yeah, no problem at all. Thank you uh, for getting in touch and uh, asking me to come on. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to be able to talk with you and tell you about a bit about my journey. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. I mean, as I said to you just um, just before we started, actually, I think you've you've managed to tick uh, three boxes for us of being the first uh, current pro first um player playing player playing abroad and also first international so hopefully uh we'll sort of talk a lot more about that but yeah thank you for uh for being a sort of pioneer for our podcast really so that's brilliant mm-hmm. no problem at all thank you for asking like i said thank you um really. so what we do normally yeah, emma obviously you're currently playing at florenze san Gene. i think i've got that yeah, right uh, so so the Serie A, so obviously the top league in italy we're going to talk a little bit about that later on but obviously you know, you don't just happen to be a, a, a pro footballer overnight. So the first question we normally start with really is like, how, what was your, where did your footballing journey begin? You know, um, not just as a player, but even just falling in love with the game, really. So yeah, if you could tell us a bit about that, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, football is, is literally my, is my first love. You know, I fell in love with the game when I was probably about four or five in, in the back garden, kicking, having a kick about with my brother. Um, and why a lot of my friends were going off to dancing. I was going off to a football pitch and uh, and playing with the local boys team, which you know is is, is definitely where I fell in love with the game. Um, but in all honesty, and, and at that time when I was a bit younger, I I never th- one had the dream or two even thought that I would become a, a professional footballer. I think it was just so much more than a hobby, but it was just pure love for this this ball and this freedom on it and running around on the pitch. Um, so my journey was a little bit different. You know, I, I, did, um, I did the whole went to university and worked on my education while always having football alongside um, what I was doing. And so, you know, I was fortunate. I, I started my female career at Coventry City. Yeah. Um, I went all the way through the, the age groups from under 10s up until uh, senior level. I made my first women's um, game debut at the age of 14, which is, is quite mad thinking about it That's now. That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, especially, you know, I feel like I've been around for years, you know, <laughs> 30 years old now, 14 is such a long time ago. But yeah, like I said, you know, it was never in my, my mind that I thought that it would become my job. It was just mm. such a pure love for the game. Um, and then I, I found myself up in Leeds at university where... I definitely enjoyed the university life for three years and maybe football, <laughs> football wasn't necessarily a priority, but it was still always there through playing for my uni team. And again, always just getting these constant opportunities to to enjoy different games and winning trophies. And and then, yeah, I'd probably say once I left university, I, I got a little bit more serious with it again and signed for Leeds United Ladies. Mm. Um, they were in the Premier League at the time, um, and again enjoyed a really two two seasons, two great seasons there. Had the opportunity to trial and and uh, train with the the Manchester City women's team, who yeah. who were basically it was going to be their first year in the WSL one. So it was going through a, a transition period basically where they were bringing in big names, but also looking for new recruits. And fortunately, that's that's where my first professional contract came at the age of 26, I was. Right. 26, offered a contract. And uh, yeah, I mean, that that was incredible to be part of that team for two seasons and be there from the very beginning. And, and obviously, you see where they are now. And, yeah. you know, they're, they're, incre- they're, they're doing great. They've definitely led the way, I think, along with Chelsea and... 
and some of the other were uh, an Arsenal with with growing the game in the women in England uh, in England. Sorry, so. Yeah, if you that don't was... really sort of a uh, yeah. Just sorry to interrupt. Sorry, I'm just um, no, 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 no. Just in terms of obviously that journey from what, like you say, from from youth football when you were like fourteen, and then going to Manchester City. What, especially in the women's game, because I suppose it's grown so quickly. What, what sort yeah. of would be the difference for you know, say, when you first were at Coventry City to when you then went to Manchester City? And I know obviously the main difference was you, you know, being a professional. But in terms of just maybe the way that the, the game was played even, or the setup, or the before the match, after the match, you know, is it, is there, is, is it grown that quickly that it's almost unrecognisable or? Uh, I mean, yeah, definitely. I think, I think the senior teams in the women's game in England grew before, I would say before like the, uh, the academy teams, you know, mm. like, so I think the, 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 the um, academy women's teams that, that needed to, to catch up, especially with the, the boys and, and now, you know, you've got fantastic academies and great coaches really focusing on, on the women's game. Um, so what, going into Manchester City, you know, it, it was linked with the men's academy. So right. in terms of resources, in terms of facilities, in terms of physio, sports sciences, it, it was a lot more advanced than, well, definitely so much more advanced than what I was used to. Um, when I when I was going through uh, youth football with with Coventry, but you know that there was still so many passionate individuals, and probably with Coventry there was a lot of volunteers. You know, these were mm, people yeah. who, at the time, weren't nece- they weren't necessarily working full time for Coventry. It was, you know, their part time job or hobby, or you know, so that in itself is is huge. Yeah. In terms of the, um, so, you know, obviously when you're at Coventry, I, I assume you'd have been sort of training midweek, you know, was it two, three times a week? And then obviously going to Manchester City, you know, the, the sort of professional element. Is it, is it, do you, do you notice the demands on your body a lot more in terms of, I know obviously you probably need to be naturally fitter, but just playing, I know cause you're basically living our dream really by being a professional. <laughs> so, um, and I think we all love the idea of people who aren't in the, the professional game of, yeah, playing football every day, but actually can it be a bit draining? Can it be a bit compared to when you were say, you know, playing, uh, at Coventry where it was a bit more part time in that sense no massively massively I mean I was I played at Leeds for two two years and you know I thought I thought I was fit you know that was something yeah. from a physical point of view that was something that I thought was always one of my strengths and then in order to get anywhere near the Man City team I literally I was fortunate because there was like a 10 month period where the league finished and then it that's when it was the um, summer, the summer league. So basically, there was a ten-month period where physically I completely beasted myself. I had to, you know. And yeah. you know, I look back now and I think the 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 young girls that have the um, have the chance to get into strength and conditioning early is is such a massive advantage because it's it's training volume that you have to build up for, for a long time, you know? And mm. so this 10 month period, I physically changed so much and uh, yeah, it's a massive demand on your body going into a full time program when you've been in a part time program. It's, it takes a lot to adapt. There were definitely days when uh, I, I couldn't move. I would like yeah. drop out of bed and uh, that was always, but you know, that was great because that's what you want to do. You want to push your body to the limits. You want to see how far you can go and, mm. and become the best player you can be. And, you know, I, I think I've managed to find my level where I'm at now, and and I'm still managing to to have a career from it. So I'm I'm very fortunate for that. But definitely, if if I could have pushed myself from a younger age, then maybe my career could be a little bit different. But I wouldn't change it. Oh no, no, no! Gosh, no, no! It's just I think because um probably from outside of the the professional game, people like myself and anyone else, you know, like that, it you sort of have this idealistic view. But I think. You know, sometimes when I'm at work or going to work, I sort of feel like, do you know what, today I really can't be bothered. And yeah. I do wonder if, if you know, I was never good enough, if I was a pro, would I feel like that? Because, you know, I love football, but actually even then, still is there some days where you're a bit like, do you know what, I just really don't fancy this today. You know, in the way that yeah, probably, yeah. we do in the jobs that we have, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, you definitely have days when you're... Um... The way that I look at it is, if I go to training, I want to give my 100%, but there might be days that I maybe only have 40 50% to give. Mm. So yeah. if I can give a hundred percent of that 40, 50 percent, then you know I know I'm giving all I've got. But there are definitely days when you go and you, you know, and again off the back of it, it can be based on results as well. So if you're going through a, a, a difficult period, maybe you, you're struggling to win a game, or mm. um, so the environment changes, it becomes a little bit more pressure, and all of a sudden, you know, it's 
it's trying to stay motivated and then push yourself and it's a constant roller coaster you know it's yeah. this is why you, we love the game so much you experience the highest of the highs the lowest of the lows and mm. and everything else in between and and for sure you have those days when you you think wow I can't be asked but <laughs> the pure love as soon as you get there and and you get that ball at your feet it's like you become a oh, for my for myself it's like I become a young girl again and yeah. and that's that's who I always want to play for her yeah no I think that's fantastic um, we always sort of we've always had this idea on our podcast where we you know like I, I was at a couple of academy clubs when I was younger, no, but I, I sort of found when I was playing that sometimes it was quite difficult being an individual in part as part of a team when you're trying to get into a squad if that makes sense. So you know mm-hmm. I was a centre half and I sort of used to sometimes in training or if we were playing games, particularly when it was getting near the time for sort of scholarships etc. I sort of hope the other centre half would mess up almost. And I just wonder if in the pro game is there still a bit of that because you know you're such big squads and stuff that. Not that you want your team to do badly, but you know, maybe somebody's in your position. I definitely think as I've got older um, and I've learned more about myself, which has been really important to improve my on the field, um, the way I play on the field. I think as I've grown older, you know, elements of that have probably are not as strong. I don't, probably don't feel as strong about that as I used to. But for yeah. sure, you know, it's. It's hard at the end of the day. Everybody's competitive. If you weren't competitive, you wouldn't be playing the game, you know? Mm. So nobody turns up to want to be on the bench. Nobody turns up to not even be in the squad. You want to play. And, you know, there's that ego inside of everyone that is telling you constantly that you should be playing, you know? And, yeah. And sometimes it's it's hard. And there's definitely been occasions. And uh, definitely, you know, my time in Manchester City, especially in my second um my second uh, season, you know, where I wasn't playing a lot at all, really, you know, and of course you ask questions all the time and of course you're secretly hoping that something will happen and you'll get that opportunity. And, and I think it's just that, you know, I think what, how I've come to terms with that now is there's two ways you can view it is one, as long as I'm doing everything that I'm in control of, ultimately I'm never going to pick the, the final 11, you know, I'm not going to pick the team that's not in my hands. So, if I can control everything I'm in control of, then the rest will take care of it, you know. And I've, then, obviously, if that opportunity comes, I know I'm ready. And then mm. I, th- I think the second one is uh, being realistic. You know, in this period, I was trying to get in the team when Lucy Bronze was there. So, you know, I'm very aware yeah. of, of my level. And, and and that's where I think realism is, is really important, you know. Like, it's that it's not giving in and giving up it's just realism sometimes can help you not you know keep asking these questions Mm. like or or tormenting yourself of why am I not playing and this that because at the end of the day football's so subjective you know and somebody might think you're the best player in the world and somebody else might think you're shit but it's just the way it is and no no I no, go on, sorry, carry on, sorry, sorry. I mean, no, 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 that's, um, that's what I was going to say. That's the beauty of the game as well. That's where we put ourselves in these mm-hmm. positions for people to, to decide. And yeah, it's, it's, I've learned so much through it from, a, from my life as well, which, mm-hmm. you know, you can transfer it all the time. So we'll move on, um, Emma, to sort of a bit more current in terms of you have now on this amazing adventure in Italy. So obviously <laughs> um, we'll talk a bit more about the differences maybe between football in England and Italy that you, from your experience in a bit. But just how did that come about? Because I suppose in the women's game, it's not as common for maybe players to go from this country abroad as what it maybe is more so in the men's game. So, so how did that all come about? And yeah, just tell us about that. Really, it'd be fascinating to hear about it. Yeah, no, I mean... Um... So, so yeah, I enjoyed, like I said, a fantastic two seasons at Manchester City. And then I kind of got to a point where I was like, I, I just want to play. Um, and also in this period, I was quite fortunate where I was actually working for Manchester City Academy as well. So right. I decided to kind of switch my focus from full-time playing to part-time playing. So I dropped down a league to Sheffield FC yeah. um, and just took up full-time work. So I did this for... It was worked out three seasons, like three years, yeah, three seasons, three years. Um, And, you know, again, I was so fortunate to work with some incredible players. You know, some of the players now I'm seeing in the Man City first team, Phil Foden, Taylor Bellis, you know, and so that was incredible in itself, but also some amazing practitioners. And from a football point of view, like I said, I was still 
getting paid for doing what I what I loved, you know. And so, mm. um, but it kind of my my days were just crazy, you know. They were a million miles per hour. So I'd be getting up, I'd go to the gym, I'd go to work from eight till half five. I'd jump in the car, I'd travel from Manchester to Sheffield. I'd eat uh, <laughs> eat a sandwich, have a coffee. I'd train for two hours. I'd come back. I'd get home probably about 11 o'clock, go to sleep, get up, do it all again. Do the whole thing again, yeah. Yeah, and you know, like it wasn't, again, it was never a case of not enjoying it because I loved it. That's what Mm. I wanted to do in that moment, but it it wasn't sustainable. Um, So I kind of got to a point in my life where I was like, right, okay, I either commit to work and kind of just focus on that or I just go for it with football. And at this point, I felt like physically, I was in the best shape I'd ever been in and I knew what I needed to do to, to be in good shape. Um, technically, you know, I, that's something that I constantly keep working on and that's something that it got so much better. Tactically, mm. you never stop learning. And mentally, I was the strongest I'd ever been. You know, when I was at City, I, that was probably my biggest problem. I was mentally weak. Right. Um, or definitely not strong enough in that period. So... I just thought, yeah, I want to give it a go. And, and then I thought, you, you know what, why limit myself to England when I could play in Europe? Mm. So, in, in all honesty, I never really thought it would happen. You know, I never right. thought anyone would be interested in me. And I didn't really have a clue of where I wanted to play or what I wanted to do. I just kind of went with it. And I was fortunate at the time. Um, I had an agent who put me in contact with uh, a guy who had more contacts around around Europe and mm. uh, ended up getting offered a contract to go and play in Verona um, in Italy. And I didn't know anything about the Iti- Italian league. I didn't know anything about the team. I, I literally knew nothing. Right. And it just right. felt right. So within a space of like, what, six weeks, I handed my notice in at work. I um, moved out of my apartment in Manchester. I packed bags and I was on a plane to Verona in literally my world just turned upside down but in in a really positive way and yeah and since then I've I've been fortunate to live in Verona last year I was at AS Roma so I yeah, lived of in course, Rome. yeah and then this season um you know I got the opportunity to move to to uh, just outside Florence in Tuscany and you know I, it's just beautiful you know to to play football full time, but to live in this beautiful part of the world is, is yeah. a real, a real, I say a dream and, and it is a dream. And, you know, the football over here, it's not, the standard isn't as high as England, right? but for sure it's growing all the time. And, uh, you know, I've really enjoyed my time over here and I've seen how much the game has grown in such a, a small period of time since mm. I've been here. So, that's if, good. if you don't me asking, before we go a bit more into the specifics of that really quickly, just, um, because obviously, I mean, we're already incredibly jealous. You got to play football every day as it was, but then to be doing it in these beautiful places, uh, I think it's just sort of tipped us over the edge. Really, it's brilliant. But the, yeah. um, in terms of just because going from one club to another, what is the actual <laughs> first sort of day like when you go? And I'm not asking, you know, you don't, I don't want you to give me details necessarily about, you know, so and so giving you a dirty look or whatever. But just what do you sort of feel like in your first session? What do they do? Do you sort of go off on your own or do you join a big group? Does, does that make sense? If you, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. The first day at a new club, really. So I think the biggest thing with when, when I moved to Verona, um, one is obviously the language barrier. So I, yeah, of course, yeah. I, I, I knew I knew no Italian, and uh, it's still a, a work in progress. Let's say at the moment, you know, language is isn't a strength of mine, but well, I have such an appreciation for it now, and it's mm. been a great challenge. Um, but yeah, I mean, the first day, I think maybe it's just because of the type of person I am, but. I just tried to go in and just embrace it. And uh, that first year in Verona was quite a transitional year. In fact, all three years, all three seasons, Mm. they've been kind of transitional years where they've brought new players in. And so it's trying to mould together a new team. Um, So everyone kind of were in, they were in the same boat, really, I think. And in that moment, I think it's just trying to find ways to connect with people and trying to definitely connect with people when you don't speak the language the same language is is a challenge and I've enjoyed that you know I, I, I like people and definitely finding out about different cultures has been has been really interesting for me too so mm. and then I think as soon as you have a ball at your feet you know that that does all the talking for you and, yeah. and when players or other players can see that that you can play and they see the the advantage of what you bring then I think that's 
that breaks any uh, any uh, any that's well that's the best icebreaker possible I think. Yeah, of course. So in terms of like the day to day, and you know, and on a game, etc., is do they sort of translate for you, or do you, I know? Obviously, you know, it would make sense they want to make you as comfortable as possible because you're one of their players. But how does it sort of work, or do you have to try and pick up bits, um, sort of, you know, from what they're saying, you know, the Italian that you've learned so far? Like, how does that sort of work? If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, now I'm, I'm I understand the bit, most of it, um, which right. is good. But the first season, for sure, it was the manager didn't speak a word of English, so oh, okay. we were quite fortunate. There was an Italian girl on the um, on the team who who uh, spoke really good English, so she was literally my English subtitles for the majority of the season. But again, when it comes to football, sometimes you know it's it's a language on it on its own, isn't it? And and when mm. you start um, you start on training and you you're seeing different things, then. You, you pick it up so quickly anyway um but yeah it's, that's been definitely been a, a barrier at times and or no, i wouldn't say a barrier but definitely made things challenging at times yeah but it's there's there's always been a way to find out and unfortunately now like i said my my italian understanding is much better and my speaking is getting there slowly <laughs> oh no 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 that sounds no i think it sounds like you got it you know you're on top of it now which is uh Fantastic. Like you say, I think that's the beauty of football, isn't it? It's that universal language, no matter what, what you speak, you know, like yeah, you say. And it's definitely. a bit of a cliche, but it is true, I think, in that sense. But, uh, no, and it's been a, it's been a real, pl- um, really, oh, really great for me. I'm also a centre defender. And so, yeah. you know, Itali- the Italian game known, is known for, uh, you know, being great at defending and, and mm. having a lot of, um, not a lot of knowledge about, defending so I've learned a lot I lost uh, like across the last three years and yeah. and also learned it from a different culture which which has been really great to improve my knowledge of the game for whatever comes next yeah I was about to say just before we move on to the sort of international scene in terms of because it's a bit of a cliche isn't it in England you know yourself where oh Italian fl- football's a bit slower and etc mm. is, is that true or does it is it just a sort of a thing that we just say here um you know what is the sort of difference in terms of the football is it maybe a bit more is it more physical in England etc or you know, I know you sort of alluded to that. But yeah, was, no, was... 100%. 100%. I think the best way I can describe, you know, my first game when uh, when I played Verona, we were playing against Florentina. And I think I must have given away about 43 kicks. Oh, really? I, I, I literally <laughs> came <laughs> off the pitch thinking, wow, I don't know if I can play here, you know? Like, you right. literally breathed on a player and they dropped on the floor and the oh, referee man. were... They were uh, falling every time for the screams and mm. the, the theatrical moments. So I've definitely had to adapt my game in that sense, you know. Mm. Like it's, I would de- like English game is a lot more physical. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it is faster. Um, but I think the the biggest difference as well, the Italian game is a lot more technical, a lot more tactical. Yeah. Um, and and that's really helped with my knowledge, like I said, of from a, a te- technical point of view, different formations, you know, going from one formation in defence to an attacking formation and. I've learned a lot. They they really like to um, to work on that, you know, like interchange their formations during the game. So mm. it's uh, yeah, I would say that's probably the difference. And um, for sure, for sure, like I said, it, it's growing, but it it's it is probably still slower than the English game at the moment. Yeah, no, no, I think that you sort of. I, I'm glad you sort of confirmed, not confirmed it, you know, but you know, you, it's quite easy sometimes to fall into that cliche, isn't it? Of you know, mm. someone like myself who's just a you know a football fan to just follow those sort of patterns. So actually, it's quite interesting. But I do think it's it, it's interesting what you say about the the culture being different because, like you say, the maybe the theatrics etc. is not it's not you know, it's not viewed in the same way as what it is in this country. We sort of almost see it as a bit of cheating. Whereas I imagine I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I imagine over there it's a lot. <laughs> part of a good you know good centre forward play is to maybe take a foul and go over, you know, in that Yeah, sense. exactly that. And that was that was my realisation early on, you know, like the whole league is not all of a sudden gonna adapt for me and, no. and so I needed to adapt my game and realise that fifty fifty balls that I would have probably gone in for in England, I needed to be a bit cleverer and uh, and that was something that took time and you know, one of the be- one of the, the best things that I'd say the best the best and worst things maybe but Italians are so emotional you know so passionate so passionate about football and they they would do every anything to win and and I think that that is linked in with that as well you know and yeah the emotion the get sometimes on the pitch it can get really emotional and and that's tested me as well to make sure that in these moments when I've got 
these maybe crazy Italians around me that I can try and keep a calm head and, <laughs> and try to make sure that I can influence them in a, in a positive way. And that's been, again, a really good challenge for me. But that's that's one of the things that I love over here. The passion for the game is just incredible. Yeah. It's it's really in, infectious, really I was about to say, you answered my last, sort of last question on football, how infectious is it, you know, and, and I suppose you, you sort of answered that. I think it is, um, it must be such an exciting adventure, you know, regardless of, of um, where you are in, in, you know, just playing football in a different country, I suppose you learn so much from that. But in terms of playing football in a, a different country, obviously you are an international footballer as well for, for Malta. So um, just tell us maybe a bit about, you know, your experience of that. I know you sort of... Um, Sorry, in terms of playing for, for Malta at international level, is there much of a difference between that and club football? And obviously, I suppose with Malta being a slightly smaller association than maybe some of the bigger ones in Europe, is it run slightly differently in that sense from, you know, when you're at your clubs, et cetera, and, you know? Yeah, no, so that's, this is something that's, that's fairly new. It's just, um, I've, I got my first cap last uh, last year in, year in October. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So to cut, uh, to cut a long story short, I was uh, while we, I was playing for AS Roma last year. Um, we were playing Milan away, and I ended up meeting just a stranger. Just ended up having a conversation, as, as happens a lot in Italy. And uh, it turned out anyway, this lady was a big football fan, and she was from Malta, and she had connections to the Maltese FA. And my uh, my nana. Um, who sadly passed away uh, three years ago now, but she was Maltese. And I always knew that, you know, maybe one day there'd be a possibility to to play internationally, but I never really followed it up. And anyway, I'm, I'm a believer in the bigger picture and, and things happen for reasons. And so after this conversation, it kind of spiralled from there really till October the 4th, where I ended up um, playing my international debut, which is... A yeah. bit mad after just a twenty-minute conversation with a stranger. That, um, that, that's incredible. In, in terms of like the, you know, so there's a couple of questions because, as I say, we never even, you know, I could only dream of playing professional football, let alone international football. So, in terms of, sorry, I don't need to. I feel like I'm getting you to sort of uh, blow the lid on everything. But do you actually get a physical cap when you get, you know, when you say they get a cap? Is it like an actual thing? Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I, I didn't, but obviously, you know, I got my shirt and, um, yeah. and other, you know, other things as well. I was. Hope, hoping for a cap but maybe maybe that's still to come um right. but yeah I mean for me like it was a whole new experience as well and um, it was honest you know that first the first uh, the first game it was kind of all set up playing against Italy at home so for for Malta being obviously a small island it was a massive massive occasion for them probably the biggest game they've had in the last 10 years and yeah. I just happened to be there and uh and that moment of standing and listening to the national anthem and really feeling as if I was going back to my roots and um, and really, you know, doing my nana and my my Maltese family proud. It was it was like an out of body experience, you know, just stood yeah. there looking looking at the flag, just thinking like I have no idea how I've got it, but I'm just gonna go with it, you know, and <laughs> see and and you know, I, I, I think it's just. I'm learning all the time at the moment. I've only been over there. I've played three games now, and we've got a couple of um, we've got a few more games coming up this this year. More European qualifiers, and I just see so much potential in this mm. island. You know, and I look at it, and I've been fortunate fortunate enough to watch the game grow in England. I've been watching the game grow in Italy, and Malta is nowhere near England, and probably will never get there. And it's maybe not as far away from Italy, but there's so much potential in, and if I can help this this amazing island grow the game from you know a recreational level to a senior level in any way that that possible then I really really hope that I can and um, mm. so I see it I see this opportunity way much more than just playing um, and and for now I'm just enjoying the experience because yeah it's not every day everybody gets an international cap at 30 years old <laughs> so that's no, no, I totally agree. I think, as I, I sort of alluded to at the beginning, I think you, you're sort of a pioneer for for everything, really. You know, in terms of you know the women's game, and then in diff, going abroad, and then obviously playing international football in Malta. Do you feel, if you don't mind me asking, you don't feel like you need to answer this? Do you feel because of your background and you know playing in the in Italy in the Serie A, the top league there, and obviously playing for Manchester City and all of that goes with that? Is there a bit of pressure on you when you play for Malta? A bit more than maybe because you'd you know be the biggest name, you'd be the sort of standout sort of a player. Um, 
do you feel like that or is that just sort of what we would view from the outside maybe if that makes sense yeah um no 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 i'm just i'm just processing what you just said no not at all yeah. uh, interesting asking that yeah i mean the uh, the manager he's he's a great guy and he actually said exactly this before the first game or before my first game sorry he um he just said to me, look, I, I want you to know that there's absolutely no pressure on you. Um, and I don't want you to feel like all of a sudden you're going to come in and and we're expecting, you know, these incredible things. He said, we're just mm. grateful to have you here. And and I think, like, again, maybe it's just the sort of person I am or maybe it's just the way that I view playing now. You know, I just see it as this incredible opportunity to just seize. And, and you know, that maybe there should be a little bit of pressure on me purely for the fact of the experience that I have. And and so if I can come into this environment and I can encourage these, you know, these players who are part-time at the moment and, and uh, literally it's, it's really inspirational. You know, it takes me back to my roots. Like some of them have to work overtime, take unpaid leave and mm. all sorts of things so that they can represent their country. And, it's really authentic and and if I can come in and in any way help them or or give them, you know, uh, or inspire them in any way to, to help them to believe that, you know, there are pathways out there and then I don't mind the pressure because, you know, ultimately this will give these these great girls a, a chance that they thoroughly deserve going above that and to, again, play the game that they love. Yeah, no, no, I think, I think that's... Um... I, I, you know, I think that's an incredible attitude to have, actually, very selfless. And I suppose, you know, you don't always hear that in the game. So I think that's, that's you know, that's fantastic of you. And uh, yeah, and I, I just, I, you know, we're obviously, um, we're quite a, a relatively new podcast, but I think we'll, we'll you know, that you'll be our new team to sort of follow um, as uh, as a podcast. And that. So we'll keep on uh, keep on top of that. But what we'll do, Emma, we'll move on to your, uh, the sort of main reason for the uh, the sort of the, the episode, which really isn't. We sort of use it as a thing just to get people like yourself on and hear from you. But it is obviously about your favourite ever football match. So obviously being a professional footballer and, and you know, having played countless, countless games, uh, we're going to, normally we, we only give people one game to choose from as their favourite ever football match. But given your sort of unique position, um, we'll let you have two. So you can have one that you, you know, have played in as a player, what your favourite ever football match was, and also one that you maybe watched as a, a fan. Um, I can do mine first if you want. Yeah, yeah, whichever, yeah, whichever way you want to do it. No, absolutely. Okay, so probably my favourite ever game I played in. Um, probably playing uh, in the Continental Cup final for Manchester City in our first year. Uh, yeah, we played. We played Arsenal and. Um, well, actually, this, I might be cheating a little bit, but the, the game before that, we played Chelsea. Yes. Yeah. And we ended up beating them 2-1. And we, the team that we had and the team that they had, we, we should never, ever have, have won that game. And I think after that, we kind of knew if we could get into the final that we could win it. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we, we had the Continental Cup final. And again, this is our first year. We weren't really expected to win anything. It was just a transitional year to come in and build the team for the what was to come in the future. Um, and again, I was, you know, I was really happy. I managed to to get picked to to start the game, and um, we ended up beating Arsenal one 0 um, in the final and, and win the cup. Yeah. And you know, I'd I'd always watched on telly and and uh, watched these moments of winning a cup and having that ticker tape moment. You know, when you go up and you you raise the the cup and all the tickets. Yeah. Tape. You know, that was that was. I'd always loved seeing teams do that. To, so to actually experience it It was uh there was there was no words you know it was just and very and we were totally the underdogs you know we we weren't expected to win that Mm. uh to win that the cup with the team that we had and i think you know that was the first cup that man city won as the as the new man city women and obviously you've seen success since then so i feel very proud and privileged to be part of that team and to be the very first part of the very first squad to uh, to win silverware for the club. That's incredible. No, so, and I think, you know, when you sort of play in those games, if you've got me asking, obviously, you know, there's a bit, it'll be a big crowd, there's noise and all of that. Can you sort of zone out from that or, or even, I know you're obviously you're a professional, but is there still that moment when you sort of walk out and you'll be like, whoa, hang on, does it ever hit you or is that not until after the final whistle? Yeah, I think a bit of both. I think in that moment, 
uh, like I said, from a mentality point of view, I, I still could have been a lot better than, or, you know, I'm a lot stronger now. So I think if I played that game in the mindset that I am now as a player, it would probably be totally different. Yeah. But I think it was just nice to to appreciate that moment as well, you know, to actually take it in and, and realise that, wow, I got to this point and experiencing a cup final and playing against one of the best teams in the league at the time mm. and well still is you know Arsenal's a massive a massive team and um, yeah. I just think the whole like the whole occasion and the whole game it, it couldn't have gone any better for us and it was just a, a real privilege to be part of it all and it just summed you know that it, it was just a great end into a first year where I learned a lot as a person and learned a lot as a player yeah and sorry just um one more question because obviously you know having won like a, a cup like that what what actually happens afterwards because you know we've all you know people like myself and that played local football and it, it you know you win a, you might win a trophy or something like that and it's a, it's a bit of a thing in the changing rooms and all of that but because obviously you know it's a lot bigger much bigger competition that you're in what sort of happens do you have like dignitaries come in <laughs> or you know not literally straight afterwards you know like once everyone's sort of out of the changing rooms do you have to go to like a, a media thing is do you know what sort of happens even in like a cup final that sort of stuff really yeah there's a, I mean a lot of like the the media from City like they obviously you know that City TV that are constantly there and there's then um, with the, we had Steph Houghton there at the time and Jill Scott so you know probably the, the bigger names were yeah. doing um, yeah. which is, is great and, and then obviously the club just more, more than wanted to uh, to reward our efforts in in the best way possible and so i think if i can remember now you know we we obviously enjoyed um a good trip back from london um, yeah. and then the, <laughs> the next day we, i think man city were playing at home so we paraded the cup around the the etihad and right obviously shared it with the fans who who at that time the the, the fan base has grown so much now in comparison to them but still it's a court for manchester city and Walking around the Etihad, it was that was just incredible in itself, and and then you know the club obviously um, provided with us with you know a great evening and and just different things and like I said because it was the first and very much unexpected, mm. I think everybody just just even you know everybody in the club behind the scenes everybody just really really appreciated what we'd achieved and 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 we celebrated together and and that's very much Man City as a whole you know you see it with the men you see it with the women they they're very much a family and and that was the pinnacle of it for me yeah that's amazing no no I think it's uh I think you know it's such a uh, an incredible experience like you say especially being underdogs um I can see why that would be your your favorite game as a player um so just mm. moving on obviously you know um as, as well as you know, first and foremost, you're you're a professional player, but obviously you have to be a football fan as well, I suppose, to be a professional. So, you know, what's the best game that you've ever watched? Um, a dra- drama, despair, heartache, elation. You know, what what would be the sort of be- your favourite ever football match that you sort of ever seen yourself? Um, I think. I mean, there's so many. I could literally, you know, talk. I've yeah, so many, but give, give us a few if you want to. You there. can sort of take us on a, a journey of a few if you'd rather. If it's too hard, yeah, to no, 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 no. I think uh, being a, a Coventry City fan, um, and not encountering much success <laughs> in the last however many years 10, 15, 15 years, um, being at Wembley last year and watching the uh, watching us get promoted, yes, um, of course, yeah, that was. Well, I mean, I, obviously, there's so much trouble that, oh, there was so much trouble that was going off the pitch, and so maybe not as many fans have have always been um, been at the games. But in that moment, you know, you have sixty thousand Coventry City fans. You see how big the club actually is, um, mm. and and watching us win and, and get promoted into into League One and actually achieving some success was wow, you know, that was uh yeah. oh, it was two years ago, sorry. I don't even know what year I'm on. But no, yeah, no, don't worry, no, no. <laughs> was, um you know, Co- Coventry City will always be my heart and my, my mm. family, my mom, my brother and my dad, you know, they, they go to us all games. They've always had season tickets, even with all the troubles when we played at Northampton and and so to see them get some success and, and get promoted, I think that's up there as being one of my favourite 
favourite moments recently anyway as well. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I think we, we sort of, we, we pretty much cover anything but the Premier League on this podcast. And we've as we've really got a soft spot for Coventry anyway, because it sort of feel like it's, you know, they've been through so much and, and always seem to, be, against the odds, seem to come out with something. You know, the whole thing with the stadium, financial irregularities, all of that. And not irregularities, but, you know, issues. And I think, you know, it, it, it's always, it, the fans seem to go right through the mill, but they're, they're always there, like you say, to still you know, get around, you know, to, to be able to fill Wembley and things like that. I think it's just an incredible, incredible club. So I'm really pleased you, you picked the game like that as well, you know. That, you know yeah, you know. no, I mean, I, exactly this, exactly. It was, yeah, 3-1, it was just, uh, you know, the, you see the clubs now and you, you see the, the small, I say smaller clubs, Coventry is not a small club, but yeah, from a business point of view, it's it's really difficult to try and compete with the big dogs, you know, it's, it's really yeah. difficult. Yeah. In that moment, you see a whole city come together, and you just realise how powerful football really is. And and um, I think that that game for me, especially with my family as well, you know, they've my brother especially, he's such a big fan, and he follows them everywhere. And to to go through all the heartache that he has done previously, to actually see that potentially we might be on the way up, I think mm. there was just so many so many emotions involved and. You know, so far we're we're doing we're doing well this season. I, I I got to watch them when I went back over Christmas, and I've, I've got to say it's probably one of the first Coventry City teams I've watched that's been able to string more than four passes together. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm massively excited for for what could potentially happen this season as well. And um, yeah, yeah, it was a it's it's a, a special club. It's my home. Well, yeah, close to my home and. Mm. Uh, so yeah, no, honestly, Emma, that, that was uh, that was brilliant. In terms of uh, you going forward now, obviously, just before we uh, we have to sort of end the podcast, you you got a game this weekend against uh, at the time of recording, sorry, against Inter. Is that right? Have I got that information? Yeah, correct? that's right. Yeah. yeah. So obviously, you're, you're in mid table at the minute. Um, not too far off of I think what you're on thirteen points. You know, not too far off the top two. So you could uh, string a few results together. So hopefully, you get a win at the. Uh, at the weekend but um it just leaves me now just to sort of say thank you uh, so much for doing this really appreciate that and as i say you you you've been a pioneer for so much in, in football as it is and you've also been a, a pioneer for this podcast now being the first uh, pro international and player to uh, to be play abroad that we've interviewed so it's uh, yeah just thank you so much for doing this i really appreciate that no no problem at all and uh, yeah thank you for getting me on and uh, you know i just if i can share my my story and my international or my um journey abroad with with as many people as possible you know it's it the best thing that I can say is it's not just about a football experience I mean mm. that's that's the bonus the life experience that you get is will set you up for for whatever comes next and I think you know that's the beauty of of leaving your comfort zone and and go in go into a, a different country and uh and the beauty is, if you get to play football and or the best game in the world while you're doing it, then it, it's not the worst thing in the world. Definitely not. No, that's incredible. Well, I've got to say, you're an absolute inspiration to, to, to everyone. So, yeah, thank you so much, Emma. No problem at all.